Can there be four more terrifying words than the words from the Bible God gave them over? There's different kinds of wrath with God. There's you know, direct wrath. There's the eschatological wrath of the day of the Lord. There's eternal wrath in hell. But there's this abandonment, abandonment wrath, wrath. Where, God, where God turns people over to their sin. Welcome to Understanding the Times Radio with Jan Markell, Radio for the Remnant, brought to you by Olive Tree Ministries. Today, Jan visits with our ministry representative, Ken Michael. Ken travels America to bring our message to your church or group. They hit on several current issues in the world and church. Here is today's programming. But Bible teaching, prophecy, America must go away. Did you know that? America cannot stand as we've known it. America's at this moment, leaderless. National policy has been exchanged for socialism. Human rights, number one prevailing argument now, the gay agenda. The Constitution is now being declared a living document. You know when there's a living document, you can change it. Well, I'm glad you could join me for the hour. That was Pastor Jack Hibbs with just a little tease to introduce the hour. I'm going to be joined here momentarily by our ministry representative, Ken Michael. And let me ask a question here. Did you ever think you would see the day when executive orders could change your and my way of life with a stroke of a pen and not just one order but dozens to hundreds of executive orders and never change things in a good way always for evil those you know are they engaged in pushing back against this darkness or are they in denial i suspect many are the latter and that's because so many live for today and for the hope that life is going to go back to normal Happy days will be here again. Well, maybe. I tend to doubt it, but maybe. Many people think we always survive the tough times and the Western world always bounces back. Let me just say a word about Ken Michael. He is our ministry representative. He is a retired police detective. He is a security consultant. He's a representative who is speaking and ministering in churches and conferences literally across America. We'll say more about how his background in detective work plays into what he's doing today. That may be a real intrigue to some of you. Ken, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Jan. It's always a pleasure to be with you. Ken, you are actually meeting more people than I am in that you're traveling full time here and meeting the folks that you're speaking to, the churches, etc. What do you think are the primary things Christians should be paying attention to right now? And I ask that question because it's easy to get overwhelmed. You can look at headlines and get simply overwhelmed. And then, of course, some people actually tune out. What do you think they should be paying the most attention to? First of all, Jan, you and I both get questions about what's happening in America. Most often asked questions that people want to know is, are we going to return to life as it was before the virus? Or, in other words, are we going to return to life as normal? Another question, is there going to be a revival in the church in America? Are we currently under God's judgment is another question. And finally, is there going to be a civil war like this revolution? Are people going to rise up and say, that's enough, I've had it? And that clip you played from Pastor Jack is spot on. The quickest way to flip a nation is to remove Christianity, which we've already done and then usher in where the vacuum fills quickly with everything that we're seeing right now. We are experiencing a form of socialism, which we know is an ungodly form of government. So how do you quickly do that? Well, you weaponize the government against its people, and you remove everyone who disagrees with your agenda. And we're witnessing that right now from the main players in our federal government, FBI, the CIA, our military, We've purged our military of all of our wonderful, godly generals. They're all gone. They've been replaced now with people that are going to go along with the current agenda. And then look what we've done to our police, defunding the police right now. Let me address a specific question to you, Ken, and I think my audience would like to know. You are a retired detective, and obviously you know policing. And like me, when you started hearing the term defund the police. That had to be the most lunatic sounding thing you had ever heard. But now, two years, three years later, look at the wreckage that we've had from this kind of leftist lunacy. Absolutely. And I'll give you a perfect example. Police officers across this nation are either retiring 
they're quitting or they're moving to areas where they don't have to put up with this defund the police movement. And I'll give you an example. When I first applied for my police job, I was competing against over 300 candidates. I recently spoke to a former partner of mine from the same department, and he told me that they had three openings for police officers. Do you know how many people applied for that? Twelve. Really? Twelve applied for three positions. This used to be an honorable, wonderful career that people wanted to get into, and now we've demonized it. Not just in the police, but every part of our emergency response system. Our learning institutions now have been changed. Big businesses and big corporations have now turned against its people. The medical community and hospitals now are involved in this. And of course, you can't pull this off without the propaganda that's going on from our media. With them on board promoting this, you can achieve just about anything. Let me just transfer our conversation here, just in the interest of time, to the church. We've got so many pastors going woke. Of course, you experienced that. You even told me more than one, but you were going to be ministering in a particular church, or I think you had hoped to minister in a particular church. And one of the gals who wanted to get you into that church, her pastor just basically said, we're not into that. Now, what that exactly means without confronting him, I don't know. Apparently, we're not into understanding the times. That's the purpose of the meetings that you're putting on, understanding the times, discerning the times, contending for the faith, talking about some of the things going haywire, both in the world and the church. Again, Ken Michael is a representative for the ministry, does outstanding presentations in the church. But tell me about this gal, because I think she's part of a church, and there are legions of them out there. They simply don't want to hear the truth, which, again, people are perishing for a lack of knowledge. Ministries like ours trying to provide that knowledge. Then we come up against churches and leaders within the church who just say to their people and to us, we're not into this. How come? They bought into this sophism of the social justice gospel, Jan, and that's unfortunate. And when I was speaking with this woman, we don't have to name the denominations because it's not some, not many. Most churches now in America have been given over to this. The only thing I can explain is this woke social justice that's being preached out there. And what she said is they're not interested in preaching or learning about a third of the Bible, and that's Bible prophecy. God tells us what's going to happen if we continue down the road we're going right now. He explains it in detail about what's going to happen if we don't stop, turn away, and repent, and go back and follow his laws. Some of the topics that you're covering, granted, they're very, very sensitive, and we're going to be playing some clips. As a matter of fact, I've got a lineup of clips that I'd like to play this hour. And to be honest, the topics you touch, I touch on a regular basis, are sensitive. And I think one of the things that's troubled you the most as you've prepared for the presentations that you're giving is now what we're doing to children. Of course, the mornings in the Bible are legion about what we can't do to children. And yet there's a whole movement out there, and we have to handle this carefully and sensitively, that's out to destroy children. I think what I'd like to do is play, it's a four-minute clip. It is of Tucker Carlson because The latest thing that he is tackling is the transgender movement and the utter unbelievable destruction it is doing. There's a growing movement designed to confuse children about who they are on a fundamental level. This is the cult of transgenderism. The transgender phenomenon is not a small-scale operation. It's not led by a single man. Instead, it's led by the most influential power centers in the country, our own government, big corporations, the medical institutions, and of course, the mass media. The princess who came to your ball tonight was me. Trans ideology is as simple as it is fundamentally incoherent. Boys can be girls and girls can be boys. Gender, which is how you feel inside your body. The priests wear white robes and they become rich as they demand bodily sacrifice of their victims through disfigurement, sterilization, and ultimately, in some cases, even suicide. Adults are being lured into this, but the primary target is children. Now, in many places, even acknowledging that any of this is happening will get you canceled, kicked off social media. You can be fired from your job. It may even be punishable by law. Criticism of the transgender movement is not allowed. How did we get here? 
Anyone who's lived in this country as recently as, say, 2015, knows that this phenomenon is entirely new. Prior to a few years ago, trans ideology had very few acolytes. How did it become the reigning religion of our ruling class? So historically, gender dysphoria afflicted 0.01% of the population, so roughly one in 10,000, and they were overwhelmingly male. Uh, the numbers were even smaller when it came to females. I think it was one in 30,000. Today, the newest report is that one in 20 young women in college are identifying as trans. That is an enormous spike. In the UK, where they have centralized medical care and they can see the numbers more easily, they have, there have been reports of a 4,000% spike in the referrals of young biological women to the National Gender Service for hormones, followed by surgical intervention. We're seeing this among teenage boys as well. But the, the really startling spike and the reason that the original researcher, Dr. Lisa Littman, knew that there was something going on is because gender dysphoria, the severe discomfort in one's biological sex, had always afflicted boys and men, overwhelmingly. Once you're in the movement, it's very hard to get out. Few of the young people are able to escape with mind and body intact. We spoke to one who managed to do it. When I was about 15, I started using Tumblr. I had an eating disorder since I was pretty young. There's a lot of messages that said, if you feel bad about your body, that means you're trans. I was just going through this period of like, I don't like how I'm treated as a cis person. I don't wanna be cis because cis means you're uncool and you're privileged and you're an oppressor and you're bad and I don't wanna be that. In that way, I was really incentivized to try to figure out a way to make my voice heard in these communities. And obviously I can't change my race. I can't really change my sexuality. Um, so the only thing left was to start playing around with the gender stuff. So I decided to call myself a Demi girl, which is one of the 40 million genders. And that basically means that I'm mostly a girl, but I'm a little bit not a girl, which is just like, what does that even mean? And then after that, I went to Demi boy, and then after that, I went to gender, gender fluid. And after that, I eventually went to trans boy. But all this took like two or three years of just going through this repetitive cycle of changing this identity and changing it again. And it was just never enough. There was a lot of hopelessness for a long time, a lot of regret. The, the feeling of regret was intense. This is our Alice in Wonderland world, folks. I tell you, it has really gone berserk. But as believers, we need to be confronting the culture. You're listening to Understanding the Times Radio. I'm Jan Markell, bear with my voice for the hour, if you would kindly. And I have on the line Ken Michael, who is traveling for the ministry. He is a retired police detective, security consultant. And he's been traveling the country for the last couple of years, sharing on the issues that this ministry has been tackling, and that is how the world is racing towards judgment because the King of Kings is going to return any day. Ken, you provided that clip for me. Help us understand. Here we have, according to the clip, Tucker Carlson's presentation here, a 4,000% spike in the issue that they were relating this whole trans phenomenon and I think the thing that has kicked it into high, high gear would be social media. Would that be right? Absolutely correct. And just for the audience to know, I was a school resource officer for several years. I worked with juveniles extensively. And then, of course, I was a juvenile detective. We never saw any of this in schools. The counselors never reported this explosion of gender dysphoria that we're seeing right now. So please understand that this has only happened within the last 10 years. To pull this off like they have, the first thing you have to do is redefine it. You heard that young girl talk about identifying and redefining these terms. That's exactly what the Merriam-Webster Dictionary has done. Listen to this. The definition they've changed was of relating to or being the sex that typically has the capacity to bear young or produce eggs. And then the second definition is having a gender identity 
that is the opposite male. So when you redefine terms, you can do just about anything you want. And Tucker was absolutely right. This is an explosion of young adolescents experiencing gender dysphoria, and it is a cult. And it's raging across our country right now, and it's part of our culture. I would say this is a demonic attack, and our children are in the crosshairs. This is Satan's plan. If he can't destroy children in the womb, he's going to destroy them outside the womb. And he's come up with a diabolical plan to do that. Another question we need to ask is, why is this happening all of a sudden? Abortion, you have to follow the money. They're teaching kids to have sex at an early age. So the more kids that have sex at a younger age, the more pregnancies, the more pregnancies, the more abortions, the more abortions, the more money. And believe me, there is big money now in getting kids to transition their gender because it's not just a one-time thing. Once they transition, especially if they have surgery, they're in for years of giving hormonal blockers so that they can stay the gender that they transferred to. I want to build on that because here's Walt Heyer, and he lived transgender world for eight years, and I'm going to let Walt tell his story. My name is Walt Heyer, and I have a website called Sex Change Regret, and I help people who find regret, and I try to prevent people from having regret. Oh, and I lived as a Laura Jensen female, identifying as a female for eight years until I got my sanity back, thank God. In the group that I work with, there's over 60% of them were sexually abused at some point in their childhood or, or early life. Researcher Lisa Littman found that nearly two-thirds of trans youth and young adults have been diagnosed with at least one mental health disorder prior to the onset of gender dysphoria. Conditions like depression, anxiety, self-harm, eating disorders, or neurodevelopmental disorders like autism. And nearly half of these young people had experienced a traumatic or stressful event just prior to the onset of their gender dysphoria. There are all sorts of ways to be a boy. You know, I think they're grooming the next generation. Um, I think that's very clear. I see the very same thing that happened to me. My mom's parents were extremely poor lived in a, a shanty shack behind a junkyard, actually. And my grandmother was a bit of a drinker, and she made uh, women's clothing. And she, you know, I just kind of watched her making clothing when I was there. I had a curiosity about it. So she made me a purple chiffon dress. Well, that purple chiffon dress became the most destructive component in my life. That one single dress confused me to the point to where as a child, I was going to bed at night, laying in bed, crying, because I couldn't understand what was going on. And it went on for about two and a half years before my parents found out because it was a secret. Grandma was keeping it a secret, and she told me to keep it a secret because she obviously knew something was wrong with it. When Dad found out his method of helping me shape me and correct what Grandma had done was a hardwood floor plank and heavy abuse, Further down the road, his adopted uh, brother heard about the purple dress, and Uncle Fred decided that I was fair game on it by the time I'm seven, eight, nine to start sexually molesting me. My name is Kathy Grace Duncan, and I lived as a man for 11 years, and I transitioned out of that lifestyle 28 years ago. You know, my dad was emotionally and verbally abusive to my mom, and I watched my mom become a victim to that abuse and kind of crumble underneath the weight of that. And the messages that that gave me was that women are weak and women are hated and women are vulnerable. And so when I looked at my mom, who's supposed to be my uh, role model, I was like, I'm a girl, she's a woman, I'm gonna grow up being a woman. I don't want that. But yet I didn't want to be the man my dad was. So at a very early age, again, probably four, um, I'm, I made the vow that I'm gonna be the man my dad is not. I was sexually abused by a family member and I know that that played into it too and affirm those three things, you know, women are hated, weak, and vulnerable. I am two generations now away from this new culture that's coming up. And if we don't have people who have gone down the path before them and fight for them, I don't, I'm not sure what's going to happen. Ken Michael, I think the point that we're making is eventually God's going to say enough is enough because they're going after younger people and children. He's going to call his church home and the tribulation is going to begin. 
they are grooming the next generation. We're into our second generation now that believes this is perfectly okay, perfectly normal. And tragically, they're learning this from many of our public schools, which have become some of the most powerful indoctrination facilities, along with the online chat groups. And these same administrators and schools and chat groups are using the same recruitment techniques that cults use when recruiting their victims. So this isn't some isolated incident that's happening. If you don't think this is going to affect your life or your loved one's life in some way, you're sadly mistaken. This is currently overtaking our society. And unfortunately, not hearing from those who should be speaking out against that, especially those in the church. Ken, when you began in the world of policing and detective, etc., was it even manifesting back then? We never saw any of this, especially with young people and in the schools. When I was a juvenile detective, I investigated some of the worst crimes that adults do to children, from physical abuse to criminal sexual contact. At least I was able to charge these people with a crime and they went to jail. What we're doing to children now is demonic, and it's nothing short than allowing the sexual mutilation of our children. Jan, I have to tell you, we've reached a watershed moment in our country. If we, as believers, as followers of Jesus Christ, do not get involved in this, we can no longer afford to just go to church on Sunday, hear a good sermon, go to Bible study during the week. But if we don't become involved in our culture and push back against this, we are going to pay unbelievable consequences for what we're allowing to happen. So much is broken today, Ken, including the culture as we're talking here. But what it needs is they're going to reject the Lord Jesus as the one who can fix society. See, what they're doing is they're waiting for Mr. Fix-It, who's going to come along and say, I can fix everything and make the culture and the economy, etc. I can make it all work. We know that this Mr. Antichrist, the church is gone. We're never going to meet him. But nonetheless, the world is begging for a savior. And you're right. The warnings in the Bible about what happens to people who come against children, they're very, very serious. When we talked the other day, Ken, you said something to me. I think you were addressing the question to me, and I think we need to address it, and we can do so in part two of my programming. But you said, are you prepared for what's coming? Now, what's already here is enough to have to contend with. We've already talked about some of it here in the first half hour of the program. We're contending with people not knowing if they're male or female and trying to change that and consenting to outrageous surgeries. I'm going to play one more clip here. This happens to be Dr. Phil and Matt Walsh. And we talk about Matt Walsh. We go to the whole what is a woman phenomenon, which we really aren't going to have time to cover. But let's play this clip and talk about it. Joining us on stage is Dr. Susie Denbo, associate professor at Kent State University. Dr. Denbo, how do you feel those who oppose using pronouns are taking the wrong approach in this conversation? There's the extreme approach that you are admittedly taking. Um, and then there's also just ordinary people that might not be comfortable with the language change. She began by saying that my view is extreme. Okay, so the view that every single person on earth has held up until 15 seconds ago is extreme. They are conflating gender and sex because on one hand they say, well, you got your biological sex, but then your gender is whatever social construct. But then they turn around and say that trans women are women. So a man yeah, yeah. Who, who, who identifies with, the, with the, the gender, the social construct of womanhood, actually is a woman. Part of me wants to ask why you care so much, uh, because right. it's really right. not that big of a deal. Oh, yeah. Can I answer right. that? Um, I, I care about the truth. So, so basic truth matters. I want to live in a society where people okay, care about fine. the truth. Um, I care about children. And this, these insane ideas about too. gender are being, are being foist on kids. Um, and that, that bothers me quite a bit. I care about the women who are having their opportunities stolen from them. I care quite a bit, yeah. I wanted us to have a safe place to be able to talk about this. And it seems like we should just keep the dialogue going and, and hopefully find some middle ground. Uh, yeah, that was Matt Walsh, Ken Michael, and he's trying to stand for truth and righteousness here. But see, the world wants nothing to do with it, nothing. Tragically, and the little dirty secret that is not being told is that we're giving these children actual drugs to change their gender. When they do confront it, they say, well, don't worry, they can transition right back when they stop taking that. Let me give you some idea of what we're doing to our children right now. We're giving 14 and 15-year-old boys the drug Lupron. Lupron is used to chemically castrate sex offenders. That is permanent. 
you cannot reverse that. That's what we're doing to young boys. We're currently surgically removing the breasts of healthy 12 to 15 year old girls and calling this health care. This is not normal. This is not okay. This is irreversible. And we're going to pay a price for doing that to our children. Jan, I think history is repeating itself. Jeremiah 619. Listen to this. Pharaoh, earth, I'm bringing disaster on this people. The fruit of their schemes, because they have not listened to my words and rejected my law. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. I will put obstacles before this people, before parents and children alike. They'll stumble over them. Neighbors and friends will perish. Jan, God tells us exactly what he's going to do if we don't obey him. Quick heads up. We have an Understanding the Times event coming up Thursday, October the 6th, here in the Twin Cities. Remember, all of these events every other month are live streamed to the whole world, and we have dozens of countries watching them, thankfully. And that would be live streamed at markhenryministries.com. We'll be featuring Pastor Billy Crone that night on Thursday, October the 6th. Revived Church, formerly Brooklyn Park Evangelical Free, for those of you in the Twin Cities, and realize most of you listening around the country. Again, you can live stream it from 7 to 9 p.m. Central Time on October the 6th, and we will offer a DVD on it about a week later. We archive it at no cost at olivetreeviews.org. That's the Olive Tree website, olivetreeviews.org, and go to video. It'll be archived at markhenryministries.com and live streamed at markhenryministries.com. If you want to watch it live, submit questions that night. Mark Henry and I will be the co-hosts for the evening. Again, this is every other month, Understanding the Times, Thursday, October the 6th. Pastor Billy Crone, 7 to 9 p.m. Central Time. If you can't join us, other ways of participating, watching, post-program, getting the DVD, etc., we will be talking about some extremely cutting-edge and serious issues. We've had over a year of these events, and about one and a half million have watched online in that last year. Folks, in part two of my programming, I think we're going to ask, and we don't say this to scare, we may say it to prepare you, not to scare you, And that would be what is coming. We've talked about some incredibly outrageous issues here just this first half hour of the program. But I am concerned that some things are on the horizon that not everyone's going to be prepared to handle. We do want to talk about that. Is there going to be a crisis before the next election? If that would be the case, what might the various opportunities be for the left to perpetrate on America? State of climate emergency, perhaps? Global economic collapse? Another viral pandemic, I am suspicious of that. What about a cyber attack? Shutting down various things that make everything run. There's so many opportunities that evil has that good people need to be pushing back against. And then what about, I keep reading this incredible headline in front of me, Visa, MasterCard, American Express, begin categorizing sales at U.S. gun stores. Just what is that portending? Nothing good, I can promise you. We're coming back in just a minute or two. Don't go away. I'm going to return with Ken Michael. Again, he's a representative of Olive Tree Ministries. He's available to come to your church or group. And you can write him at ken at olivetreeviews.org. Ken at olivetreeviews.org. More in just a moment, folks. Coming right back. So we know and we see what's happened in the church. What about our country? Have we completely removed God from our country, from the public forum in our nation. I told you, we removed the Ten Commandments. You can't even display them anymore. How about our Congress? What's going on there? We ask it in the name of the monotheistic God, Brahma, and God known by many names, by many different faiths. A man and a woman. Now, most people think the most egregious thing was that he said a man and a woman. But if you listen to that and you listen to the whole thing, what he's actually doing is he kicked the God of the Bible out of that house. And he invited a pagan spirit to come into that house and oversee the proceedings. That's who he was praying to, a pagan Hindu God. And when you kick God out of your life, out of your family, out of your business, out of your government, he will leave. 
And that vacuum will fill quickly. Welcome back. The Bible says that the last days are going to be as the days of Noah. Joining me for the hour is Ken Michael, our representative available traveling the country, visiting churches and conferences. Ken, I know that really gets to you when it's so hard to be a part of this last days, days of Noah generation and watching it every day and chronicling it and talking about it and posting articles about it tends to get us down. I know you would agree. What I tell my audience is if you think it's difficult to listen to, try looking at this every day and gathering information and then going out and teaching it numerous times. And we just can't get discouraged right now. Especially for young people, I have young people come up to me usually after the program and ask me, well, what do I do? I always tell them, always plan for the future, but put Christ first. If you put Christ first and plan your life around him, and that's really for all of us, if we put him at the forefront, make our plans around him and his will for our lives, he's going to make sure that everything turns out the way he wants it to. So we should not be fearful and we should not worry. I referred to an article before the break, and the headline is Visa, MasterCard, American Express, to begin categorizing sales at U.S. gun stores. Let me just read two short paragraphs. Folks, they're trying to change our way of life in ways that righteous people are not going to be very happy. It says two of the U.S.'s largest public pension funds are pressing the country's largest credit card firm to establish sales codes specifically for gun-related sales. I'll read two short paragraphs. Payment processor Visa has said that it plans to start separately categorizing sales at American gun shops, joining MasterCard and American Express, which said they plan to move forward with categorizing gun shop sales. Visa's decision on Saturday is a major win for gun control advocates who say it will help better track suspicious surges of gun sales that could be a prelude to a mass shooting. You've been in law enforcement your whole life, Ken Michael, and I know when you hear things like this, you and I know that if you outlaw guns, only outlaws have guns. Good, righteous people cannot defend themselves, which is why this is so outrageous. And yet Visa, MasterCard, American Express, and I'm sure many other companies are going to go along with this, not to mention ESG scores, which we're not going to get into this hour. But as a police officer now retired, what are your thoughts here? You're absolutely right, Jan. And understand one thing. We're witnessing the systematic removal of our constitutional rights and freedoms where the government is going to take control over its people. And if you haven't been paying attention, you should know that the First Amendment is already gone. We can no longer say anything we want. You can't go online or go into a public forum and speak your mind. Because if you disagree with the people in power, you will be shut down, you will be removed, you will be taken off social media. So the First Amendment is already gone. So what amendment are they telling us they're coming after next? Well, we know the Second Amendment. And it's a key step to controlling any population is to disarm them. I've spoken at many churches across the country, and I've talked about this, and I've had numerous people come up to me after who are from other countries who fled tyranny, who told me, we fled exactly what we're experiencing right now. I've had people from China, from Cuba. I had a woman from Venezuela come up and say, we are replicating exactly what I fled from. She said, there's only one more step in this process, and that's where the government comes in and takes control by force, either by using the police and or military. She said, that's the only step that's remaining that we haven't done yet. So we're one step away from a total takeover by the government. I believe that we've quickly come to the place where we're only a one-party government right now. I will be shocked if they don't hold on to power this coming election. We talked and gave a tease, part one of the programming, And I think many righteous people, and again, we just talked about it's going to get more and more difficult to be able to even purchase a weapon, maintain it, etc. Do you think martial law is around the corner? I kind of think you do. Again, Ken Michael is a retired law enforcement. He's been 30 years in the business. So is this around the corner, Ken? I believe it very well could be. It'll happen when a part of our society realizes 
if and when we've lost the republic. I pray it doesn't get violent, but it very well could be. And then that's when the government is going to step in and say, see, all these guns, all these people that own firearms, they're the problem. They're the ones that we have to clamp down on. They're the ones we have to remove, and we're going to come and take their guns. But what about actual martial law? The president has said he could declare a state of emergency for a number of reasons, and it could be a global economic collapse. He's already said that he's willing to declare a state of emergency for climate change. He can do this, and then if that happens, he has a say over everything. If people do rise up, if it does get violent, which it very well could, he could declare a state of emergency and declare martial law, and then he dictates what is going to happen to the rest of us. This summer, we had Dr. Mark Hitchcock and Jeff Kinley with us here in the Twin Cities, and I want to just play a short clip, a little exchange at our June meeting between myself and Dr. Mark Hitchcock. And Mark is talking about wrath right now, and I think he's really talking about what he's going to identify as abandonment wrath, and i got to think that's probably what's happening. How do we know if the events we see unfolding in the news are God's judgment on our nation? Well, I, I, think, I think a lot of things that are happening in our country today are not necessarily um, the sign that God is going to judge us. It's the sign God already is judging us. He already us. is. Yeah, that's what you have in Romans chapter 1. Yeah, there's different kinds of wrath right. with God. There's you know, direct wrath. There's the eschatological wrath of the day of the Lord. There's eternal wrath in hell. But there's this abandonment, abandonment wrath, wrath. Where, God let, where God turns people over to their sin. And actually in Romans 1 where it says God gave them over, it doesn't just mean God takes his hands off. It's actually, a, it's actually once people have made that decision of pushing them further in that direction that God is giving people over. And so people often look at Romans 1 and they'll say, well, you know, God's going to judge us because of, of the, you know, the sexual immorality in our country and the, the, the uh, sexual confusion in our country. But that's actually the sign in Romans 1 yes. that this has already Sorry. begun. Ken Michael, and he has been my guest for the hour. He is available to come to your church or group if you'd like to write him at ken at olivetreeviews.org. Ken at olivetreeviews.org, or you can call the office here if you'd like, or email the office. Ken, I think the four most terrifying words in the Bible are God gave them over. And that means God has given up on some people. He engages in abandonment wrath. He can do that to an entire nation. But right now, I want to talk about abandonment wrath of individuals. The average Christian cannot easily comprehend that there are some people that God has actually given up on. We consider him patient and long-suffering because he is, but there comes a point in time, and we've talked about some topics that I believe push God over a ledge, particularly when it comes to the children issues that we covered first half of the program, and now we're into abandonment wrath. That was Mark Hitchcock. Your thoughts, Ken Michael? What was Pastor Mark saying, actually? He said God is going to reach the point where he sees that we're not going to stop that we're not going to turn away, that we're not going to repent. The Bible says, repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That means you turn away from what you're doing. And if you read Romans 1, 18 through 32, you're going to see that we're doing everything God tells us not to do. In fact, we've made most of these things laws. They're perfectly okay and they're perfectly acceptable. So when God says he's going to give us over to a debased mind, what that means is he, God, is going to render each individual and or nation unable to discern his moral truth any longer. And is that not what we're witnessing right now? How else do you redefine the terms that we're seeing right now? How do you redefine God's creation? We can't even define what a woman is. And that's true. What is a woman? We don't even know the most recent Supreme Court justice. She at least didn't know how to define a woman. Ken, we're going to turn a little corner here just because we have talked about how the darkness is encroaching on everyone, including the church, perhaps even targeting the church. You have a little clip that we're going to play, and it happens to be three voices that are going to give some encouragement for the hour. Dr. David Jeremiah, Pastor Jack Hibbs, and Pastor Mark Henry. Pastor Mark Henry is the pastor I work with bi-monthly here with having our Understanding the Times events, and that little clip of Mark Hitchcock was at our event back in June. Let's play this very uplifting two-minute clip of these pastors. 
And oh, my friends, how many truths there are in the Word of God about the days in which we are living and the time which is yet to come. If you want to know what in the world is going on, you have to turn to the Bible for some answers. Have you ever asked yourself this question, why am I on this earth at this particular time? Did you know that Almighty God could have dropped you down along the landscape of history any place he wanted? But he put you here. He put you here for now. God wants you here for now. So don't complain about not having lived at a different time or wish you could live in some future time. Embrace the fact that God has given you this time and then find out everything you can about how to live this time in the Holy Spirit power that he wants to give you. God has never let you down. You may have misunderstood what God has done. That's most often our situation. But he's never let you down. Never. And you can build a foundation of faith on what's going on in the current world around us. And what I always tell people is when you start to feel like you're going insane, you need a, a song and you need a verse. And so tonight I'm going to share a verse with you that God is using in my life to keep me sane. And I pray that it'll keep you sane. Just recently I was in a public setting and there was a, a wonderful lady there, not a follower of Jesus. She had grown up in the church, but she'd left the church. She was in her uh, early 30s. And she leans over to me, kind of looking around so that no one would hear. And she says this, Mark, are we living in the last days? I think I'm going crazy. And I said, we are living in the last days. You're not going crazy, but you need the Lord Jesus Christ. So I don't know where you're at in your spiritual journey tonight, but don't go crazy. Look to the Lord. God has the answers. And I want you to focus on those three pastors because, folks, you see, crises cause people to be open to the gospel. Bad news causes people to be open to the gospel. Crises causes people to turn their lives around. We're sharing some things today. Ken actually shares a lot of this in his seminars across the country. Not to discourage you, not to share gloom and doom, but to invite you particularly those that don't know the Lord, to turn your lives over to the Lord so that he can begin a new work in you. But also to remind you, folks, God does have things under control. He's allowing calamity to happen. How many times do we say it on this radio program? So that everything can fall into place. So we don't want you to get overly discouraged. For some reason, God chose you to be a part of this final generation, this crazy upside down Alice in Wonderland world. God has asked you to be a part of it, has asked you to be on the front lines of it, and to try to make a difference. Can you take it from there? I always tell people, this is the most exciting time in history to be alive. And what God is shouting from the heaven, he's looking for those followers, those who are willing to take his truth and engage the culture. And I tell people, right now is our time. This is the time for God's people to step up. We are on a rescue mission where we need to go out and find people that need to know who Christ is. We need to tell them about Christ, not just about all this stuff that we're talking about that's happening. Yeah, we need to be informed about that, but we need to find those who need to know Jesus Christ. And don't get discouraged. Revelation 3.10 tells us, because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I will also keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world, to test those who dwell on the earth. God is testing us right now. He wants to find believers, followers of Jesus Christ, who are willing to step up. Take your talents and your treasures and go out and preach the gospel to every living creature. Find those who need to know who Christ is. And then, I believe, we're right on the cusp of Christ appearing in the clouds and bringing his church home. What a moment that's going to be. Ken Michael is a retired police detective, security consultant. And Ken, you've got about 30 years in that field, and you are in regular touch with men and women who remain in that profession. Let me ask you, this is a little bit off topic, but I think it's important because we opened the program and we referenced again this, I call it demonic, defund the police movement. How's that working out for your neighborhoods and your communities, folks? Look, I was raised in Minneapolis, Minnesota, one of the prettiest cities on the face of the earth. Because of this defund the police, I have a destroyed city. I really do. 
I'm just 20 minutes from where the George Floyd incident happened. Again, that was a terrible tragedy. Tell my audience how they can pray for the police today, for anybody in law enforcement. We see some terrible travesties. We see the police making mistakes, but then we see the police coming under terrible condemnation just for trying to do their job. So how can we pray for them? Not only do we need to ask for God's intervention in our law enforcement, but we need to pray that we find people to come in and join these ranks. We need to find godly people to come in, followers of Christ. We need them to get involved. We need them to join law enforcement. After all, there are warriors. There are protectors. We want those who are followers of Christ involved in all of this, whether it's our government, our defense department, our military, whether it's our politicians. We need a massive infusion of godly people, followers of Jesus Christ, if we're going to impact this culture. We need a massive indoctrination of followers of Jesus Christ in every aspect of our lives. If we do that, we are going to make a huge impact on what's happening, and we're going to do exactly what God commands us to do. What are some specific ways in which we can pray for our law enforcement? If the moment's right, and I've talked to many police officers on the street, and I walk up to them, not only do I thank them for their service, but I tell them, I'm praying for you. And if the moment's right, just ask them, can I pray with you right now? I just want to say a prayer for you. If you have a church that's pro-law enforcement, hold gatherings for law enforcement. Invite them to your church. When I was on the street, I used to go to services at my local church. Get your church involved in law enforcement. Let them know that you're being proactive and that you support them. We obviously need to pray for their safety. You have told me, and we mentioned at first part of the program, the police force is now reduced down to a bare minimum. Who on earth would go into this profession, Ken? That's where we need to find those that are followers of Christ. We're going to step up, take this into a place where most people don't want to go. Followers of Christ are doing that everywhere. They're doing it with a right to life. They're doing it in the gender affirmation area. They're doing it in schools. We have to start infusing Christians into our culture, not just Christians, followers of Jesus Christ. They need to become actively involved in this if we're going to make any difference at all. Ken, I recently got an email from Karen. I'm going to read her email. Folks, many of you will identify with, and I'm going to follow it up with just a few brief comments because we are quickly running out of time. Karen says, would you please present a radio show to encourage your listeners who are discouraged and made doubtful by rampant evil and the delayed rapture of the church? Now, she continues her email. She says, the late great planet Earth was published decades ago. Keeping the faith becomes more challenging every day. We believers have a pain in our neck from looking up. And for what? Will the Savior ever rescue us from this scary world gone Kafka-esque and looking like a Dolly painting? That's an email I got from Karen. I've inserted it into an article for my fall 2022 print magazine, Are You Weary of Being Outraged? I can't read the whole article. It would take too much time, and my voice is laboring throughout this hour, as you can tell. But I do want to say this, folks. There are over 365 verses in the Bible that tell us not to worry, not to be anxious, not to be fearful, and not to fret over evil men. We've talked about evil men a lot this hour. On so many days, I know believers are inundated with horrific headlines, with predicted scenarios of doom and gloom, that staying calm and praising the Lord are very, very difficult. I get it. Even knowing that the Bible says the last days will be perilous. Most of us could never have imagined, even though some have been reading the Bible and have been Bible students, those of you listening, for 50, 60 years, we never expected to see a time when the spirit of the Antichrist would be so prolific as it is today. We never thought we would see America decline and no longer be a superpower. We never thought that the likes of George Soros, Klaus Schwab, Bill Gates, Yuval Harari, Barack Obama, and quite frankly, the entire Chinese Communist Party would be the puppet masters running America, plus legions more of wicked men and women who are literally scheming in dark, smoke-filled rooms. And we were reluctant observers of the fundamental transformation of America 
that Barack Obama promised in 2008. Quite frankly, we didn't believe him. And that is why I keep urging everyone, and as we wind this program down, I am doing it again. I urge you to, first of all, hold on loosely to this groaning planet and to have an eternal perspective. Because once final day events are set in motion, as they have been, certainly since 1948, and even more so in the last 10 years or so, once they're set in motion, there's probably no going back to normal. Ken Michael, would you agree with that? Absolutely, Jan. I speak to people all the time, too, that they're rapture weary, they're disheartened, but you want to be blessed. Then there is a book in the Bible that promises a blessing, and all you have to do is three things to be blessed. And that book is the revelation of Jesus Christ. In Revelation 1 3, it reads, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it. Well, what does that mean? We don't want to just read it. We want to share it. In the Greek, that means you share this book with others so that you give them hope. And it ends with, for the time is near. We know that that time is near. We know that the rapture could happen at any moment. If you do those three things, read it, hear it, share it, then you will be blessed. Just think, Jan, if we didn't know about these things were going to happen beforehand, I would be going out of my mind right now. But God loves his church so much that he's telling us exactly what's going to happen right before he returns. That's how much he loves us. So pay attention to that book. Read it. Understand it. If you don't understand the whole book of Revelation, find a pastor that does and have him teach it to you. It is amazing how God is revealing exactly everything that's going to take place right before he returns. You can reach Ken by writing Ken at olivetreeviews.org. He is traveling the country right now as one of our representatives, and he'll do an outstanding presentation at your church or group. Just some thoughts here as we wind down. Again, I have said for years, actually for decades, that if we look around, we're going to be depressed. If we look up, we will have hope. We will be able to cope. We will have joy in the midst of Earth's sorrow. As those little clips indicated some 20 minutes ago, for some reason, God has allowed you to understand the grand plan outlined in the Bible. Better days are ahead. Actually, glorious days are ahead. I'm going to go out of the program here with two simple verses. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 16 and 17. They really summarize at least what Olive Tree Ministry represents. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command with the archangel's call and with the sound of the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first and then we who are alive and who are left shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. First Thessalonians 4 verses 16 and 17 I want to thank you for listening, folks. We'll talk to you again next week. Contact us through our website, olivetreeviews.org. That's olivetreeviews.org. Call us Central Time at 763-559-4444. That's 763-559-4444. Four 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 four. We get our mail when you write to Olive Tree Ministries in Jan Markell, Box fourteen fifty two, Maple Grove, Minnesota, five five three one one. That's Box one four five two, Maple Grove, Minnesota, five five three one one. All gifts are tax deductible. It is both a privilege and a challenge to be born for such a time as this. But always remember, God remains in control. He holds you in the palm of his hand. The Bible said the last days would be perilous, but everything is falling into place. <laughs>